Jackson. Welcome to worship this afternoon. It's great to have all of you here. We also welcome all those who are worshiping with us online at this time as well. We continue with our midweek Lenten service theme of His Final Steps. Today's theme is His Final Steps Led to a Fig Tree. We continue with the opening hymn, hymn number 595, Fruitful Trees, the Spirit Sowing. service for this afternoon can be found up on the screens. Please stand. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Do you believe this? Yes. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. He sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We continue with our sermon text for this afternoon, which comes from Mark chapter 11. The next day after they had set out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. When he saw a fig tree in leaf in, at, in the distance, he went to see if he might find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves since it was not the season for figs. Jesus said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree wither down to the root. Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus replied, Have faith in God. Amen, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, everything that you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you, forgive you your sins. The word of the Lord. We continue by singing the psalm, Psalm 4c, O God, be gracious.
bow our heads in prayer. Grant peace to your people, Lord, that amid the stresses of life we may rest quietly, knowing that all is right with you. Since your Son has paid for every sin, defeated every enemy, and rules at the right hand of your throne in heaven, let us fall asleep each night in peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue with viewing the next section of the Passion History video. Look, the hour is near. When the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, ah! cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place! Jesus said to him, Rather draw the sword, will die by the sword. You think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me every day? I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. This has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. 
The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. <laughs> the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say. Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Take my life and let it be. Grace and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. As I read through the sermon text for today, that gospel lesson we had, were some of you maybe a little bit perplexed or maybe confused or shocked about what we were reading there? 
We're following Jesus' steps, his final steps, and here we see Jesus going, taking some of those final steps to a, a fig tree. And, well, what does he do with that fig tree? Why might you be puzzled or shocked by his actions? Well, we see him going up to that fig tree and cursing that fig tree to the point that what happened to that tree? It, it died, and this might seem a little bit out of place for Jesus. Was he acting out in anger? Was the pressure of this week just building on him, building on him, like you might feel the pressure build on yourself at some point, and finally he just burst and lashed out at this fig tree? Was he getting angry and frustrated that these teachers, these te teachers of the law, these Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, all of them weren't listening to what he had to say, even though he kept reaching out to them with God's word, but they kept rejecting it? Is he getting frustrated with the disciples who just don't seem to be getting what he's telling them about what will be coming up this week? If we were in Jesus' position, we probably would feel that pressure building and probably start getting angry. And yeah, we might, might have lashed out in anger at this victory, or maybe we might have done far worse and just been frustrated with the whole group of people in general and maybe brought judgment down in the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas for all those people who didn't trust and believe in the message that we are bringing. But as we look at this section of Scripture, as we look at this gospel lesson, that's not what Jesus is doing. It isn't a lashing out in anger or frustration. No, he was certainly being tempted, as we see in, in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, We do not have a high priest who is able, unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. He wasn't reacting the way you and I might react. He was doing this for a reason, for a purpose. He never once fell short and never once fell into sin. So the question is then, as we read this section, on that Monday of Holy Week, why was Jesus doing this? Why did he take his steps there to that, that fig tree and end up cursing it and, well, ending that tree's life? He said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. Then Mark records, it says there, and his disciples were listening. Keep that phrase in mind. We're going to go back to it in a little bit. But before we get to that, maybe we should stop and talk about the fig tree and why Jesus was frustrated with it, or at least seems to be frustrated from the outside, where he had a, a deeper meaning behind this. The fig tree itself, we can imagine, it probably was of a good size, 15 to 20 feet. That's roughly the size that those, are, those trees are when they're full grown and really producing figs that you would find in an orchard. And the trees can get even bigger than that, up, uh, bigger than that, up to 25 feet tall. And the trees themselves, well, figs, that was a staple of the, is, the people in Israel's Palestine's diet where they were able to eat these, the, the, these figs. And oftentimes these trees would produce three crops a year even. Not only did it sustain them, cause a, be a good part of their diet, but it could even be a bumper crop. This is in a way part of their regular diet, part of their everyday life. They would be very used to seeing these figs. We see recorded there that in March, there around this, well, in this time, in late March, they usually, these trees, they lose their leaves and they start getting them back. As we see here, they were in leaf. But it's a little bit early in the season. Normally, you might not, at this point, have those trees fully ripe and full, those figs fully ripe and full, so you can eat them. But something's interesting about those fig trees that even before these leaves come back and they become so lush and so thick, they're really good for shade and they're beautiful trees, even before all that starts happening, you can see these new crop of figs already growing on there. That's probably what Jesus was looking for. Going up to this tree, pulling back the thick foliage that's so good for shade and looking for some fruit for to be there for the next crop to come in. And what does he find? He finds nothing. Nothing there, so Jesus goes and he curses the tree. Completely curses it, so that when they're walking by the next morning, it says there, they saw the fig tree wither down the roots, and Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the, free, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. With this curse that Jesus sent to this tree, it instantly ended that tree's life. It was over and done with, it was smoked, it was gone, nothing left, just like if you would take weed killer, herbicide, and spray all over your lawn, and then a couple days later, it's just brown and dead. But why? 
Jesus was using this as a point to teach his disciples and teach you and me. It's a reminder for us, as Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's one reason why Jesus took some of these final steps to this fig tree. It was, he used this to show how dangerous it is for us to prove unfruitful in our lives. Not just for our trees, but for all of us. You see, Jesus was going to this tree not because he was hungry for some reason, that he needed a morning snack, and he didn't get it, so he got angry and then lashed out at the tree. After all, we've heard in the Bible how it talks about how Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, right? He was fasting, and the devil was coming at him with with all these different temptations, but Jesus never once fell short there and very tactfully rebuked the devil there with God's word. Maybe he was a little hungry in the morning. It doesn't seem like Jesus would go and do this out of anger. That's where you come back then to that phrase I asked you to remember, where it says, and his disciples were listening. He wanted the disciples to see what would happen. He wanted to teach them something on this day, this Monday of Holy Week. Because you see, right after he left this fig tree, it's not recorded, we didn't have it read for us today, but where did he go? He went to the temple then. Went to the temple there to go and see what was going on there, which should have been a great and wonderful refuge, a great place to go. But that's not what he found. You see, he was using this fig tree as kind of like a children's message or an object lesson to teach them and teach us something. Teach us the, what happens when we don't bear fruit in our lives and a warning to us. You see, as Jesus would go to that temple, what would he find? The temple itself, it was a beautiful complex. It would have been one of the wonders of the world, really. Even if you weren't a Jew, you probably would want to go and see this because of the architectural feat that was there. Not only that, it was where, well, you could go worship God. In a way, it was like this beautiful fig tree with all these leaves leafed out that could provide the shade. It was a great and wonderful thing, but when you got up and close, uh, close and personal and you pulled back those leaves, you realized there was no fruit. Because of what was going on at that temple. There were tons of people there buying and selling things. would have probably been buying and selling animals that would have been used for the sacrifice. And you think, okay, well, some people were doing this as a service. This is great and wonderful, so people can go and have sacrifices and worship except their hearts were not in it. They were going through the motions. They looked good on the outside, but when you pulled everything back, there was no fruit behind it. They were going and chasing after a love of money, a love for other things, a love of self-preservation, of trying to maybe make a profit off of God's word in some way here, not doing it out of love for him. Jesus may have been going there with the words of Hosea in his mind, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Jesus' whole point is, I want your hearts, and not the outward actions, not all the fluff and everything that goes around it, but I want the meat. I want you to trust and put your full faith in me and bear fruit. Jesus went to the temple, and what did he do? He cleansed the temple. He kicked them all out, cleansed it completely of all this stuff that was going on that was going against God's word, all those people who were just going through the motions. It might seem a little bit out of place there, but it's really not. What is is for us is a reminder that we don't mess with the God, the Lord on high, then we don't test him. We don't see how far we can push it to the line because we have to remember something. There we see in the Old, uh, the Old Testament verses quoted by Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews where he says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. We realize that the Lord is loving, the Lord is gracious, but the Lord and the Lord is patient, but he does judge people as well. But there is an end to this where Jesus can say and God can say, that's it, this is over and done with. So we come back to that basic thought. The fig tree was really a children's message in a way, an object lesson, where our Savior cursed that fig tree to drive home the truth, really of a parable that he had about a fig tree not that long before this. We're there in Luke chapter 13, we see recorded, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the gardener, 
Look, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why even let it use up the soil? But the gardener replied to him, Sir, leave it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put fertilizer on it. If it produces fruit next year, fine. But if not, then cut it down. That warning there when that parable wasn't just meant for fig trees that say, okay, when Jesus comes around, you better be producing fruit. No, it was meant as a warning for God's people and for us. The Lord is patient, the Lord is gracious, but he is also righteous and just. He expects fruit from his people, and the prophet Hosea, serving as the Lord's mouthpiece, used this very same picture when he says this. I regarded Israel like grapes found in the wilderness, I regarded your forefathers like the first ripe fruit on a fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Peor, and they devoted themselves to a shameful thing, and they became a disgu- as disgusting as a thing they loved. So what about you and me? Are we bearing fruit for our Lord, or are we just going through the motions? Are we making ourselves look all great and wonderful and lush like that fig tree on the outside, but we pull back the branches, we pull back the leaves, and we realize there's nothing behind it. There's no meat there behind it. There we understand why Paul begins to say this, and he says, As fellow workers, we also urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, At a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. Look, now is the favorable time. See, now is the day of salvation. See, this cursing of this fig tree is meant to get us to think and look deep at ourselves. Are we going through the motions, or are we bearing fruit? To not just put on that outward appearance, thinking we can hide from God when we really can't. You see, this cursing of this fig tree, excuse me, This cursing of this fig tree might seem a little bit out of place, too. Where Jesus went and destroyed part of his creation, in a way, where he is a perfect steward of this creation. It's not the first time we've seen that in his ministry, have we? There have been other times where maybe he's destroyed some fish or something like that to, to get something across, to teach a lesson. Maybe the biggest example of that is where Jesus, where Jesus had driven out those demons and they went into those pigs and they fell into the sea. Jesus did all that for a purpose, to teach you and me, to reveal more of his plan and to reveal more of his love for you and me. That's what he was also doing for the disciples and for us with this. Because what happened later on? 24 hours later, those disciples went past it again, and they saw a miraculous sight there where they walked by as he took those final steps of the fig tree. He was teaching them something else, where he's teaching them also the power of prayer. Because when they walked by, what happened? What was the reaction? We have it recorded that Peter blurted out, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus replied, have faith in God. Amen, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, everything that you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Use it as an example for them to show, hey, prayer works. This tree it was dead in 24 hours. Try to imagine what that would have been like for those, those disciples there. We have weed killers now, right? We have herbicides. You might see that in the news. Uh, advertise that you spray this weed, it'll be done and dead in 24 hours. Maybe that's something more common to us. We also maybe never realize that, okay, if we, if we spray a bush or something with it, does it die the next day? might start looking a little scraggly, but as what's described here, this was dead town to the root. You can say that this tree was dried out. There was nothing left. It would be amazing today, let alone even back then when they didn't have something that could kill a plant that quickly. It seems that prayer did something that seems impossible, and this is what Jesus was trying to get across to them as well. Where James, later on, he describes it this way. He says, prayer of a righteous person is able to do much because it is effective. Elijah was made just like, it was man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on, on the land for three years and six months. 
He prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its harvest. There we see another example. Prayer is powerful. Prayer can do what seems to be impossible, can it? Where prayer there, what did it do? It controlled, well, God controlled there as answering the prayers. The weather conditions where it stopped raining for three and a half years, and Elijah prays again, and all of a sudden the water begins to come. Prayer can, well, as we see here, move mountains as Jesus describes. He's teaching us this lesson as well. Because sometimes, well, maybe we don't believe it. Maybe we don't believe that prayer can do the impossible. Maybe we're full of doubts because it seems like our prayers have gone unanswered. Maybe it's a prayer for, an, for cancer to be healed in yourself or a loved one or some disease or some ailment that you're going through or that a relationship should be mended and it doesn't seem like God is answering these prayers. Or it's just not answering, he's not answering them the way we want him to. But Why? Because our Lord is righteous and holy, and he has the whole picture in mind for us. So often we're going through this life, you can think we really, really got tunnel vision, don't we? Where we just see what's in front of us, and that's all we can see. We can't see the whole picture. Maybe it's like that you're, you're in the woods, and you're trying to find your way out, and your sides you can't see because of all the trees, so you keep going forward. Well, God's the one who's on top, seeing the whole forest, seeing the whole scene, and knowing how things are going to work out, and guiding you there. And answering your prayers in that way. Because he is a God of love. A God of grace. And uses even those terrible, most heinous things that the devil puts in this life for us. And uses them for our good. Even if his answer to our prayer is no. We can see that gracious answer really when we see the Apostle Paul. Where he goes to God in prayer. He asks three times that the thorn be taken from his flesh. And, and what does God say? He says, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will be glad and boast all the more in my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ may shelter me. We can even rejoice when God says no. And we can pray in confidence knowing that God will answer prayers in the best way possible for us. And we can be pray in confidence knowing that our prayers do do the impossible. As it was said there, Jesus said, if you pray and you believe that you can move mountains, it'll happen. Now what Jesus is trying to do is get the, the disciples' atten attention and yours and mine as well. He's describing something impossible, but prayer can do it. He's asking us to think deeply and really consider what we're praying for. One of the greatest things we can pray for is to pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of those sins of not bearing fruit, of going through the motions, of not trusting in the prayer and the power of prayer that God has given to us. Really, as we are praying for that forgiveness of sins, we're really praying for something impossible. Mark 11, 25 says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. But if you do not forgive, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. Think about the really impossibleness of the forgiveness of our sins. What I mean is nobody else could do it, could they? No one else can forgive our sins. We're, we're going and sinning against a God continually, and, he st and, and he, we ask for forgiveness, and what do we do? We continue to sin more and more. Would you forgive someone who did that to you? A sinful nature tells us, no, not. We only do it because God did that for us. He did what was impossible. He was the only one who could die for the sins of the whole world. So we ask God to forgive our sins because Christ did what no one else can do. His final steps took him to that fig tree, and then later on, it took him to the temple, and later on, well, take him to Gethsemane, and later on, carrying a cross up to Golgotha, where he'd be hung on that cross there. To do the impossible. To take on the sins of the entire world on him. Because he's the only one who can do it. In doing so, he washed the sins of the world away. Washed all your sins away once and for all. Because he loved you. He loved me so much. Since we know that, we're motivated then to bear fruit. Motivated to, to give thanks to God with our lives because of love that he has shown you and me. Amen.
At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving to our Lord and Savior. Please also place any white attendance cards that you have filled out in the offering baskets as they are passed. We also sing the offering hymn, hymn number 719, Lord, teach us how to pray. stand for the responsive prayer of the church. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to free us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Guard and guide those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries, chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and values as Christians. Keep in your care those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict in personal relationships, and those victimized by war and injustice. Comfort all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Watch over those who care for others. Pastors, counselors, physicians, nurses, social workers, and caring friends. All who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Hear us as we pray in silence. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join in the prayer of Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom is the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn.
Good afternoon. It's great to have you all in worship. As you can probably smell, um, there's a meal after the service that is chilly down in the basement. Uh, before we um, go down there and uh, we dismiss after the service, we can join in the common table prayers. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for in his mercy endures forever. Amen. Lord, bless your evening. Amen. 